All right, well, this morning, um, as I told you, this, this is a topical message because we really can't find everything that Jesus did in, in one verse or perhaps in one paragraph. So I'd like to just read one verse, uh, which is kind of a summary of what our Lord Jesus did, and then just break it apart by looking again at this arrangement that I drew your attention to from Isaiah 53, and then breaking this arrangement down a bit to see what Jesus had to do in order to actually bring this about, as far as becoming one with us and dying for us, but of course also living for us, being raised from the dead for us, being exalted into heaven where he rules and reigns over us. So we're going to be looking at, at all these different things, but let me begin by just reading the one verse which is in 2 Corinthians 5.21. By the way, this, if I'm not mistaken, is also our memory verse. This would be a good verse uh, to remember, um, uh, not only for your own well-being, but also um, that you might be able to help others find their way to Jesus. This is what Paul writes to the Corinthians. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. If you remember last week, the righteousness of God, that's the righteousness by which we're accepted by God. It's the righteousness that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. So He, the Father, made Him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin. Now again, He laid His guilt, our guilt, upon Him, okay, not that uh, he actually became sin itself, nor even guilty of having committed those sins, but rather took our guilt upon himself um, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So let's, let's think about this for a minute, and let's begin, first of all, by way of review. And now we have been considering, as I've already told you, the work God did and is doing um, that each of the three persons of the Godhead are actually involved in to redeem us from our sins. And redemption means, of course, to make a payment, okay? To pay our debt to God's justice. When we're talking about redemption, he's not redeeming us from the devil. He's actually redeeming us from himself because we are liable to God's court of justice. So Jesus is making a payment. Uh, the Father is the one who gives the payment. Jesus is the one who makes the payment to pay our debt to his justice so that he can eventually bring us into heaven. Now, last week, we looked at what the Father did in, in this work of redemption. He's the one who chose to save us. Now, we know that he made the choice because that's what he tells us in his word. He says through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Again, this is part of that covenant of redemption, the Father making a choice, a choice of us in Jesus who has agreed to come into the world to be our Redeemer. Now, we know that He had to be the one to make this choice because we know that in our condition as we came into the world, we never would have made that choice. We never would have chosen Him. Think again about everything that the Apostle Paul tells us about ourselves, that we have sinned. We sinned in Adam. We've sinned every moment of our lives since we came into the world. You know, even as babies, we had within our hearts a hatred of God, an inclination against Him, and that is sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Uh, we were in the flesh, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, so that we would not submit to the law of God. We could not please God. We would not obey God. That, that was our state. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that we came into the world dead. Remember what we sang from uh, Count von Zinzendorf's uh, hymn, now let the dead, or let the dead now hear thy voice. What do you mean dead? Well, we're dead when we come into the world. We're born, we're physically alive, but we're spiritually dead. And in that condition, we were following the devil and we were the children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, Jesus said that those who are in the darkness hate the light and won't come to the light. That's why the Father had to choose us and why his choice could not have been based upon what he foresaw that we would do because as he looked forward in time, all he would see is our flesh, our rebellion, our unwillingness to submit, our hatred of him, okay? We would not have come to him he chose us so that we might come to him. 
Now, the wonderful thing about this, of course, is that God could have justly left every single one of us to face the consequences of the crimes that we have committed. That would be just of God to do, wouldn't it? But that's not what he did. The Bible says he loved us and in that love chose us and chose to give his son for us the only price that could have saved us. Now, this brings us to the second thing that makes salvation so precious, that the Son was willing to come and to pay the price, the only price that could be paid, of course, to redeem us. Now, Paul tells us about this in our passage in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the first thing we want to look at is this, that the Son agreed to come into the world to save those whom the Father chose, to save us. I want us to see as we go through this that we are very much involved in what Paul is talking about here because if we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, he is talking here about us. Now, first of all, we do need to remember this, and that is the audience that Paul was addressing the letter towards or to. He wrote this to the church in Corinth, right? To those who professed to be Christians. Those he considered from a judgment of charity to be true believers. Now, one thing, uh, the reason I bring that up is this, because um, oftentimes Christians, professing Christians, well-meaning Christians who are in other denominations sometimes read the Bible as though God addressed the Bible to the entire world, as though everything that it says in here, everything he says is addressed to each and every individual in the world. Now, some of these things are addressed to everyone in the world. When God says he created everyone, that certainly applies to everyone, right? When he says that he provides for all, that certainly applies to them as well. When he says that all mankind fell in Adam, that certainly applies to them, and that all are under God's judgment. That applies to them as well. But when Paul here is talking about this blessing of making Christ to be sin for us so that we might become righteous in him, he's not talking about everyone. He is addressing this to the Corinthians. He is addressing this to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's actually, as I've already said, addressing this to us. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, if you love him, if you're following him, which is the evidence that you are trusting in him, then this blessing that Paul is speaking about belongs to you. The Father has not only loved you from all eternity and chosen to save you, but in eternity the Son agreed to come and to make that payment to do what was necessary in order to save you. Now, again, what is this that the Son has agreed to do? We, we've already read that in Isaiah 53. Let me read that to you again, verses 10 through 12. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Now, I've already mentioned this earlier, but I pointed out the Father <clears throat> has a secret will, a secret plan, his decree. And we see what that is as it's unfolding day by day. So as we look back through history, we can see what God's plan was, but we don't always know what's coming up, right? Well, here, the Lord basically pulled back the curtain on a portion of that plan, uh, and he shows us something of that agreement that he had made with the son and what his son was going to do in order to save us. And this is what he tells us, that if the son, 
would be willing to give himself as a guilt offering. That is, if he would bear our sins and die in our place, he would see his offspring, his children. The reward that, you know, I and the, and the fa- or the children the Father has given me, as he says in another place, those whom the Father has chosen, Jesus would receive us. He would see his offspring. He would prolong his days. Remember, bearing our guilt meant that he had to die in our place. So after he laid down his life, he would rise again, never to die again. His days would be prolonged. He would live forever, both to rule and reign over us, as well as to intercede for us as our great high priest. And then uh, Isaiah also says this, the good pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hand. He would be exalted for the work that he did. And from that place of exaltation would carry out his Father's will. Jesus was given power and authority over all the powers of heaven and earth and to be able to direct everything for the furtherance of this plan, which means he would then have the ability not only to bring us to heaven, but to make sure that everything that takes place in the world, which is happening according to the plan of God, would work together for our good. And you know, the thing we need to be thankful for is that he would make even our failures, even our falls, right? To work together for our good, to make us to be more like the Lord Jesus. Now, this agreement, as I mentioned before, is called the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace. It was made between all three members of the Godhead. And this is the only reason why you and I have any hope this morning is because they were willing to do this. They have been willing from all eternity to do this, which means also they will never be unwilling to do this. This plan will stand forever. But now secondly, let's unpack what we just saw in Isaiah and look at some of these components. That he might bear our sins, that he might become sin on our behalf and stand in our place in God's judgment, he, the Son of God, had to become one with us. Now, we are the ones who sinned, aren't we? We sinned against God. Adam was the one who began it. You know, we like to point the finger at him, uh, and we, I suppose, in a real sense, can point the finger at him because he was our covenant head. He was the one who represented us in the garden. He was the one who broke that covenant, which we call the covenant of works. He is the one who brought us under the curse. Let me just mention, though, if we had been there and we had been perfect like him, we would have made the same choice, okay? But he's the one who did it, and because of that, we're in the condition that we're in. Um, And by the way, because he was our federal head, because he was our covenant head, because he represented us in the garden, God looks at what he did as what we did. He imputed that sin to us. If he had done well, we would have gotten that too, right? Jesus did well, and we do get that. So we like imputation, We just don't like it when it comes to Adam because when Adam did it, it it really killed all of us. Paul writes this in Romans 5.18, through one transgression, that is Adam's sin and choosing to eat the forbidden fruit, there resulted condemnation to all men. But again, the point is this, we are the ones who sinned. So the payment also had to come from us. But since we couldn't make it, God, in his mercy, sent the second Adam, his son, into the world to make this payment for us. Okay, this is God's grace. This is that covenant of grace and of redemption. Now, we do need to think again for a moment what a great privilege this is, that God chose to grant salvation. But we should think about something else, too. There were two groups of fallen beings, and he could have chosen to give salvation perhaps to both or to neither or to one or the other. And thankfully, the group he chose was us because, you know, he could have chosen to save the fallen angels. They are also rational beings made in the image of God. And they also fell. But God didn't choose to save them. You know, the son could have come. He could have become one with them. Somehow he could have suffered and died in their place, although I don't know how the death would take place except, you know, spiritually, which is unthinkable. But God did not do that. Instead, Paul tells us, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. 
so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We need to be thankful that God chose to save man and not the angels. By the way, Jonathan Edwards points out that there is actually an election among the angels too. And the way he does it is because all the angels exist at one time and they're not made by procreation like man is. That God had his elect angels too. He kept them from falling. And the rest that fell, fell permanently. Okay, so that was his plan for the angels. There's still an election among the angels. But the election is this, that the holy angels remain holy. And the others fall away and they will forever be unclean spirits. Now again, as we think about redemption and we think about the fact that God was willing to send payment for us, one who would be willing to take the price upon himself, it becomes even more unbelievable when we consider who it is that he sent, and that is his son, the second person of the triune God, one who is divine. And we know it had to be him. It had to be one who was divine. It had to be the son because no one else could endure the wrath of God. Any mere creature would have been destroyed on the cross by bearing our sins and suffering God's wrath. This one had to be divine, and of course, he had to be divine to be worthy enough to pay for the sins that we had committed because the sins we had committed were against an infinitely holy and worthy God. No creature could ever pay that debt. I used to think that maybe a perfect creature could pay the price for one other creature, one for one, but I'm not sure he could even do that because that one creature would be giving his life for somebody who had committed a, a, a crime that is, has infinite demerit. How could, how could a, a finite creature ever pay for crimes against an infinite being? Now, he might be able to take his place and suffer forever in their place, but he could never pay for that, you know, for those crimes. But the Son of God could because he is divine. And his payment would be enough to wipe out the sins of as many as he chooses to forgive. He's able to save to the uttermost those who will trust in him. But of course, if he was to pay for our sins, he had to die. The wages of sin is death. And that's why also the Son of God became man. You know, if you're ever challenged by a Jehovah's Witness, I'm sure you may have used this passage before. But just think about what it says here. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, where Paul tells us this very thing, this, the one who was God became man in order to suffer and die for us. He says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. One who is equal with God in the form of God becomes man. By the way, when it says here that he emptied himself, don't ever think that he emptied himself of his divinity. He did not empty himself of any of his divine attributes. His emptying was taking to himself a nature that was infinitely below his. God becomes united, you know, this divine nature becomes united with the human nature through a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, one person who possesses both natures. But he's still fully divine, and now he becomes fully human. And he does this in order to come into the world to die in our place, to make the payment that he might guarantee the blessings of the covenant to us, eternal life, forgiveness, and inheritance of the kingdom. Now, thirdly, to make us righteous, he not only had to die, we know that he also had to live. And I mean here, living before he dies, okay? Because righteousness is more than simply having our sins forgiven, okay? Having no demerit, you know, as you think below the zero line, having none of this does not give you positive merit. You know, it's one thing not to have any red in our ledger, but it's another thing to actually be in the black. And if we are to enter into heaven, we need to be in the black when it comes to righteousness. Now, we often hear justification defined in this way, just as though I have never sinned. Well, that's just getting rid of the demerit. That's just getting out of the red. It's more than that. It's just as though we have done everything right from the moment we came into this world to the moment we leave. So Jesus not only had to die to get us out of the red, 
He also had to obey perfectly before he died, not just so he would be the spotless lamb of God, but that he might bring us into the black, that he might give to us a positive righteousness. As the second Adam, he did everything the first Adam failed to do. Adam was put into the garden to obey, right? I want you to guard the garden. That's what's meant by keep the garden, and I want you to cultivate it, okay? Well, instead, he failed. But the, the second Adam comes, and he does what the first Adam failed to do. He obeyed God. But he had something else he had to do now because of the first Adam's failure and because of all of his children then being cursed and corrupt. He also had sins that he had to take care of, and so he had to go to the cross if he was to guarantee the blessings for us. But again, he had to obey perfectly from the time he comes into the world to the time that he leaves. So that's the reason why Jesus came into the world as a babe. Why he was born so many years ago and placed in the manger. Because he had to live a perfect life from the very beginning to the very end. If he was to give to us that perfect record. And that's exactly what he was willing to do and what he actually did. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's talking about his humiliation, his incarnation, his becoming a servant in order to do everything necessary to save us so he might lift us to heaven, so that we might become rich. That is what he was willing to do out of his mercy and of his grace. Now, fourthly, to make us righteous, he also had to be raised from the dead, which means he had to live after he died. Our sins are what actually put Jesus in the grave. Our sins are what killed him. It's the reason why he was killed, is because he was bearing our guilt, okay? On the cross, when our guilt was actually laid upon him, he became liable in God's court for that guilt, which means he now had the obligation to pay. And that's exactly what he did. He paid for it when he suffered on the cross, when he died, when he was buried, he was making a payment for our sins. Now, if that payment had not been enough, then he would have remained in the grave. He wouldn't have been raised from the dead. And not only would he have remained in the grave, we also would have remained in the grave once we arrived there. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 and 18. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. I don't know if you've, if you've ever thought about that in, the, in this light, but if he hadn't been raised, that meant that our sins had not been paid for, which means we were still, we'd still be in our sins. And then those who had died and were in the grave, they're not going to rise again, and they're not safe with the Lord in heaven. They have perished. You see, the resurrection is very important. It's very important that Jesus live after he die, which is, of course, a part of the arrangement. He would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hands. He was raised from the dead. The Father accepted his payment, and because the Father has accepted his payment, then we are forgiven. We are justified. We are safe, okay? So Jesus became man to live and to die in order that he might save us, in order to guarantee the blessings. You know, there was one last thing Jesus had to do in order to guarantee these blessings for us, and that is he had to be exalted. He had to have control, control of all things. After speaking about his humiliation and his death, Paul writes this in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Think about Psalm 110 that I read at the beginning. Sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. Paul here is talking about Jesus' coronation day, a day that took place when he uh, ascended into heaven, the day that the Father gave him over, or basically placed him over all creation. And now that Jesus has all power and all authority, not only can he bring us to heaven, 
Not only can he really subdue us to himself and subdue all of our enemies, but he can also make sure that everything that happens to us along the way is actually going to work to promote our trip to heaven. And now that he is in heaven, at the right hand of God the Father, he can also intercede for us, as we also read in Isaiah 53. He interceded for the transgressors. The Bible tells us that Jesus is continually interceding before the right hand of God, uh, before him, for us, pleading his merits, keeping us in the grace of God as our great high priest. Why should the Father forgive us? Jesus says, because, Father, I have died for them. So this is his great work as our intercessor, as our high priest. So the Father chose us. The Son came to guarantee that we would receive these blessings by living and dying for us. And he was raised and he was exalted to make sure that we would eventually receive the blessing, inherit the kingdom of heaven. Again, Paul writes, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus says, as we read in our meditation, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, if you're trusting him alone to save you, if you're listening to his voice, if you're following him, then you are one of his sheep. You can know that you're one of his sheep, that he laid down his life for you and that he will bring you to heaven. You can also know there's nothing in heaven and earth that can stop him from doing that. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now, if you're not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, that doesn't mean that you're not one of his sheep. I mean, it may or it may not. But it does mean one thing. It does mean that you do need to come to him and you do need to trust him because as long as you are outside of Jesus by not trusting him, you're still in danger. And so the Lord says, come to him and be safe. By the way, we, we know there are still many other people. We were praying for them this morning, many others out there who need to hear the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ and they're only going to hear it through the gospel. And that tells us two things. First of all, it tells us why the Reformation is important because it was a rediscovery of the gospel. I mean, the church did not know the gospel. And those who did know it were, were probably cowering in a corner somewhere, afraid that if anybody found out that they knew about it, they probably would be put to death. I mean, those were the, the circumstances in those days. But because of the Reformation, we now have the gospel. So... That's one thing that reminds us of. The second, of course, is this, that um, the only way that people who are out there are going to hear the gospel is from people who basically are in churches in here who know it, you know, because somebody who doesn't know it isn't going to share it. People who don't know it hate it anyway, so they're not going to share it. But we who know the Lord and love the Lord and have his gospel, we have it, and we need to communicate that. So let this be a reminder to us that the only way people are going to be saved is if they hear the voice of the Savior. We can't think of people in terms of, at least all the time, of who's chosen and who isn't chosen because we don't know who's chosen and who isn't chosen. All we know is that our Lord Jesus Christ has said, go out into all creation, preach the gospel to every living creature, and he will bring his people to himself. We do think about election. When we think about the state of mankind, when we think about our country, when we think about how people are going to respond to us, when we tell them about the gospel, by the way, we were reminded last, last week in the evening, not to be ashamed, even knowing people are going to respond this way, never be ashamed of the gospel. It's what basically the Lord did to save us. We should never be ashamed of Jesus Christ. But this gives us the encouragement that even though there are going to be people who are going to respond that way, there are going to be people who will respond in a positive way and who will actually come to Jesus. And they will do it because of God's mercy and of his grace, not because of our persuasiveness, but because of the message of the gospel, because of what Jesus Christ has done, because of the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel to bring them. And that's actually what we're going to be looking at uh, next, next Lord's Day, how the Spirit of God applies this work of our Lord Jesus Christ to those whom the Father chose, to those whom the Son chose.
died for. So anyway, this is what we learned this morning. And by the way, since, um, again, the gospel is so important, and because the Reformation is really the rediscovery of the gospel, I would encourage you to come this evening if you have the time as we think more about what the Lord did through Luther and other men to bring about this rediscovery of the gospel and what he did through him to promote this gospel and, of course, what the blessings, more of what the blessings are of that gospel. Well, let's, let's bow in prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to encourage us to the things that we have heard this morning.